Coming up in the program today, we take you on board the Space Shuttle Discovery as she hurtles into space in pursuit of the International Space Station. This is Mission STS-102, the focus of which is the outfitting of the International Space Station, particularly the new laboratory, Destiny. As the shuttle Discovery waits silently on the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center for the forthcoming mission, STS-102, her crew prepare to put all their training into practice, the culmination of which will be the first exchange of crews at the International Space Station. Commanding the mission, U.S. Navy Captain Jim Weatherby, a veteran of four previous space shuttle flights. His pilot on this mission, Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Jim Kelly, is on his first shuttle mission. They're joined on the flight deck for the launch by Dr. Andy Thomas, a three-time shuttle flyer who spent 130 days on Russia's Mir space station in 1998. And first-time flyer Paul Richards, a mechanical engineer who will join Thomas for a spacewalk on this mission. Their short-term colleagues, Russian cosmonaut Yuri Usachov, commander of the second expedition to the International Space Station, a veteran of two long-duration missions to Mir and a shuttle flight to ISS during the previous year, and his American crewmates, flight engineer Jim Voss, a veteran of four earlier shuttle flights, and flight engineer Susan Helms, a U.S. Air Force colonel with four shuttle missions to her credit. Family and friends cheered as the commanders and their crews headed for the Astrovan, the short ride to launch pad 39B, where Weatherby led the way onto the orbiter's flight deck, while Usachov, Voss and Helms took their seats on the mid-deck. During a planned hold in the countdown at T-minus nine minutes, the launch director checked with his teams and relayed word to Weatherby that everything was set to send Discovery on its way. Hey, the focus of the STS-102 mission was on the outfitting of the International Space Station, particularly the new U.S. Laboratory Destiny. It would also bring to the station the new Expedition 2 crew to replace the Expedition 1 crew, which was scheduled to return on Discovery. The crew transfer, the first for the station, is among the mission's top priorities. As the countdown resumed, the flight crew worked through their final checklists with the launch teams. And then, as the International Space Station flew high over the South Pacific Ocean, south of Australia, they braced for the eight and a half minute ride that would start their mission. The orbiter access arm is retracted away from Discovery and into the launch configuration. All systems are go for the launch. It is now only minutes to the commencement of the 29th voyage of the Space Shuttle Discovery with a crew of seven. T minus 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. The main engines are fired. 4, 3, 2, mission ignition. Lift off for Discovery and for her team of explorers. For the astronauts, the sunrise quickly gives way to a clear day. Under the control of the Houston Ground Center, Discovery executes her scheduled role, and the television viewers around the world are advised that Discovery is now in a heads-down, wing-level position, carrying the next resident crew to the International Space Station. Forty seconds into the flight, Discovery's engine throttled down to 72% of rated thrust as it passes through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Discovery is already at an altitude of five and a half miles. Ninety seconds into the flight, and Discovery has now expended two and a half million pounds of propellant. It now weighs less than half of what it did at the time of liftoff. Two minutes into the flight, the booster office in Houston Mission Control confirms separation of the solid rocket boosters. Little more than six minutes of powered flight remain 
before Discovery is in orbit. The astronauts move quickly to set up Discovery's systems for on-orbit operations. And once they open the payload bay doors, they got their first look at the Italian-built multi-purpose logistics module Leonardo, making its first trip to the ISS on this flight. Into the second day of the STS-102 mission, and while the first International Expedition crew members were packing their belongings and getting ready to end their four-and-a-half-month mission, incoming space station engineers Jim Voss and Susan Helms worked with mission specialist Paul Richards to set up the shuttle's airlock. They also checked out the spacesuits they'll wear during the spacewalk on day four of their journey. The purpose of the spacewalk will be to prepare the exterior of the station for the arrival of a robot arm on a shuttle mission during the following month. And the new station commander, Yuri Usachov, joined Voss and Helms on the mid-deck for work with an experiment into how a person's reflexes are affected by being in a weightless environment. The three station crew members will take readings with this instrument periodically throughout their tour of duty on board the ISS. At the same time, mission specialist Andy Thomas and pilot Jim Kelly powered up the shuttle's robot arm and tested all of its joints and its cameras. Along with supporting the mission's two spacewalks, Thomas will use the arm to grapple the multi-purpose logistics module, Leonardo. Leonardo is a pressurized moving van module designed to be taken into orbit, attached to the space station, and then, after unloading, brought back to the orbiter's cargo bay for return to Earth. The module will be attached to the Nadir, or Earth-facing berthing port of the Unity node. Before that can happen, a docking port, pressurized mating adapter 3, must be removed from that berthing port. It will be attached to an adjacent berthing port on Unity's left side. Leonardo brings six systems racks to the station. Among them are two robotic workstation racks for control of the station's robotic arm and the four cameras mounted on it. Two are DC to DC converter units, which convert electrical power from the station's solar arrays to a form usable by station systems and experiments. One is the US Lab Avionic 3 rack with components supporting both the KU band communication system and the command and control system. The sixth is a crew healthcare system rack. Over four days, the station crew members will unload the module's cargo and refill it with items to be returned to Earth. After extending the docking ring on Discovery's orbiter docking system, a camera in that system is installed for use during the final phases of docking with the International Space Station. Weatherby, Kelly and Richards finish the workday with another firing of Discovery's jet thrusters to refine the orbiter's approach to the station. Whilst the crew rested, Discovery continued its pursuit of the International Space Station, closing the distance between the two craft at a rate of about 660 miles with every orbit of the Earth. When the astronauts awoke, they were just 300 miles behind the International Space Station. With the docking schedule for a little over two hours' time, the final phase of Discovery's rendezvous with the station began with a terminal initiation engine firing by the shuttle. Discovery about 50,000 feet behind the ISS. The TI Burn put the shuttle on course to intercept the station during its next orbit of Earth. About one and a quarter hours later, Discovery reached a point about a half mile below the complex, and Commander Jim Weatherby took over manual control of the approach. Weatherby flew Discovery to a position about 300 feet in front of the station, then moved in toward a docking port attached to the end of the station's destiny laboratory. During the docking, pilot Jim Kelly helped control Discovery's approach as astronauts Andy Thomas and Paul Richards managed the shuttle's docking mechanism and rendezvous tools. Using a view from a camera mounted in the center of Discovery's docking mechanism, Weatherby centered the docking ports of the two spacecraft precisely, double-checking the alignment 30 feet out. The final approach was at a relative velocity of one-tenth of a foot per second. When Discovery made contact with the station's docking port on Destiny, latches automatically connected the two spacecraft as they flew high over the southern Pacific Ocean, just east of New Zealand. After completing leak and pressure checks, 
Weatherby and Discovery and Bill Shepard, commander of the Expedition 1 crew, open the hatches on pressurized mating adapter number 2. Expedition 2 commander Yuri Utachov led his crewmates into the Destiny Laboratory and began getting acquainted with his new home in orbit. After a ship's tour and a safety briefing came the top priority transfer of the day. Usachov moved his specially fitted seat liner into the Soyuz spacecraft docked to the Zarya module and verified the fit of his Soyuz spacesuit, in so doing becoming an official member of the International Space Station crew. Expedition 1 Soyuz pilot Commander Yuri Gitsenko moved his equipment to Discovery to take Usachov's place as a shuttle crew member. The Expedition 2 flight engineers, Voss and Susan Helms, were scheduled to change places with flight engineer Sergei Klikolov and Commander Shepard during the following week. Once the hatches between the two ships were reclosed, Ushachov joined Shepard and Klikolov to start learning about current conditions on board the station. Meanwhile, the air pressure in Discovery's cabin was lowered to facilitate preparation for a spacewalk the following evening by Voss and Helms. Their task will be to prepare the outside of the International Space Station for the arrival, in a month's time, of its Canadian-built robot arm. However, before the spacewalk commenced, Discovery's crew turned its attention to continuing assembly of the orbital outpost. With their expedition commander, Yuri Usachov, now based on the ISS, Jim Voss and Susan Helms began to suit up in the shuttle in preparation for their stroll in space. Throughout the planned seven-hour extravehicular activity, or EVA as it's referred to by the astronauts, they will be assisted by Paul Richards, serving as the in-cabin spacewalk choreographer. Pilot Jim Kelly set up at the controls of the robotic arm, which both he and Andy Thomas would operate from Discovery's flight deck, next to the spot where Richards would oversee the space warp timeline. Once outside the shuttle's airlock, Voss and Helms went straight to work. Their first task was to prepare for the repositioning of pressurized mating adapter 3, a shuttle docking port, which will be repositioned the Earth-facing berth on the Unity module to its left side berth. They crawled up the Destiny lab module to the Unity node and unplugged all the power and data cables running between that docking adapter and the node. While Helms prepared some equipment in the shuttle's payload bay, Voss got into a foot restraint on the robot arm and removed the early communication system antenna from the docking mechanism on Unity's port side, clearing the spot for PMA-3. The antenna was brought back inside the station. Next, Kelly moved Voss down to the payload bay so he and Helms could retrieve the lab cradle assembly, platform upon which the space station's robotic arm would be deployed when it arrived in a month's time. Kelly maneuvered Voss and the mechanism to the top side of the lab so he and Helms could secure it in place. At that point, the spacewalk was running about an hour behind schedule due primarily to the need to retrieve a replacement tool component after the original one floated away. Because of the delay, they were instructed to defer power and data cable connections for the cradle until the next scheduled spacewalk by Richards and Thomas. However, Helms, now in the foot restraint on the robot arm and Voss, unbolted the rigid umbilical from its stowage site in the payload bay. The rigid umbilical is a harness containing delicate powered data and video cables that will link the station's new robot arm to the lab module. Once it was released, Helms took hold and Kelly maneuvered her around the underside of Destiny where the space walkers bolted it into place. The job of connecting those cables to the lab was the task that Mission Control had decided to defer until the next EVA. With that task complete, Helms got out of the foot restraint and joined Voss to clean up in the payload bay. 
The spacewalkers stowed their tools, re-entered the shuttle's airlock, put their spacesuits back on shuttle car, and waited while Thomas took control of the robot arm and raised it high above Discovery's payload bay towards the pressurized mating adapter on Unity that Voss and Helms had disconnected earlier. Thomas moved the end of the robot arm towards the grapple fixture on the PMA, which had been installed six months earlier and served as the docking port for the subsequent shuttle missions that had delivered the station's giant solar arrays and the lab. Thomas activated the snares inside the robot arm, firmly grabbing on to the PMA. Commander Jim Weatherby ordered the Unity node's docking mechanism to release its hold on the PMA. Thomas gently pulled the docking port away from the station. Weatherby closed the petals on the common berthing system. Thomas then slowly moved the pressurized mating adapter a quarter of the way around the node. With the help of a computer-generated graphic display and the positional readings generated by the arm itself, he aligned the adapter with the portside common berthing mechanism and mated the PMA to the Unity node. That done, the shuttle airlock was repressurized and Boston Helm's spacewalk was concluded after an official duration of 8 hours and 56 minutes, the longest ever in the nearly 20-year history of the shuttle space program. The relocation of PMA-3 had set the stage for another first to be undertaken the following day. The planned installation on Unity of the multi-purpose logistics module Leonardo, the moving van of the International Space Station program. The next day was the fifth of the STS-102 mission and a busy day for the Discovery crew. One that started with another exchange of crew members on the International Space Station. Jim Voss became a bona fide ISS crew member when he too transferred his seat liner into the Soyuz spacecraft and verified the fit of his Soyuz space suit. He took the place of flight engineer Sergei Krikalov, who moved to the shuttle. On board the shuttle, Andy Thomas once again powered up the robot arm and maneuvered it towards Leonardo, the multi purpose logistics module in Discovery's payload bay. Leonardo contained 10 tons of equipment and supplies for the station, including the first experiment rack for the Destinley Laboratory. Thomas drove the end of the robot arm towards the grapple pin on the MTLM and activated snares in the arm to grip the module tightly. Then he commanded the Canadian-built robot arm to very slowly raise the Italian-built cargo module from its berth in the payload bay and move it towards the docking port on the Unity module from which he had removed the pressurized mating adapter the previous day. Sighting through a camera mounted inside Unity, Thomas carefully aligned Leonardo with the berthing mechanism and mated the two together. Mission specialist Paul Richards remotely commanded a series of bolts to secure Leonardo to the underside of Unity. There was a delay in activating the cargo carrier while Expedition 1 commander Bill Shepard connected a Unity to Destiny power cable that provided electricity to systems inside Leonardo. After pressurizing the area between Leonardo and Unity, Shepard briefly entered the Leonardo module to retrieve the cable, which he took to the vestibule between the US laboratory and Unity and made the required connection. Meanwhile, some crew members on Discovery prepared spacesuits for the second spacewalk, while others took time to lend a hand with the outfitting of the station. Shepard, Usachov and Voss worked through a series of tasks with flight controllers in Houston to activate the MTLM and its system. After some much needed rest, the crews began preparing for a day of unloading and installing equipment both inside and outside the two spacecraft. Astronauts Paul Richards and Andy Thomas quickly began making final checks for their planned six and a half hour spacewalk. On the mid deck, they were helped into their spacesuits by Susan Helms, who would guide the pair from the Discovery flight deck, and Yuri Gidzenko and Sergei Krikalov, the Expedition 1 pilot and flight engineer, who had already transferred to the shuttle for the trip home, ending their tour of more than 130 days in space. 
Jim Kelly maneuvered the shuttle's robot arm into position in front of the shuttle's airlock. Thomas and Richards duly opened the hatch and floated into the payload bay. After Richards climbed the Destiny laboratory module and disconnected cables, he joined Thomas on the underside of the payload bay cargo carrier to remove the stowage platform, a device upon which important spare parts for the station could be stored. Thomas, in the foot restraint on the robot arm held the platform, Kelly moved into the port side of the Destiny lab and the spacewalkers began to bolt the platform into place. Meanwhile, inside the station, Commanders Bill Shepard and Yuri Usachov, Flight Engineer Jim Voss moved equipment racks from the multi-purpose logistics module into the lab. And when they had two DC power conversion racks in place, Richards moved around the lab and operated the circuit breakers, providing power from the station's P6 solar arrays to the new racks in the lab. Kelly moved Thomas back to the payload bay to retrieve the next piece of hardware the pump and flow control assembly, which can pump ammonia and control valves in the coolant system on the P6 truss. Thomas was moved back to the side of the lab and mounted on the just-installed stowage platform. They also finished connecting several cables put in place by Jim Voss and Susan Helms during their nearly nine-hour-long spacewalk the previous day. Richards and Thomas also scaled the station to the top of its 240-foot wide solar arrays and were successful in engaging a fourth latch for the port side array's structural brace. Several other get-ahead tasks also were accomplished during the spacewalk, including a check of a Unity module heater connection, an inspection of an exterior experiment called the floating potential probe that had been operating intermittently. Spacewalkers reported that they didn't see any status lights on the probe. And investigators on the ground will use that information to continue troubleshooting. Thomas and Richards then inspected the work areas around the lab module and stowed all of their tools before re-entering the airlock to conclude a six-hour, 21-minute spacewalk. It had been an impressive day's work. Inside the station, all seven system racks, equipment that includes electronics, communications gear, experiments and medical facilities, were moved to the station's destiny laboratory. Included among those racks was the first major piece of station science equipment, called the Human Research Facility, which will study the effects of weightlessness on the human body. In the next episode of the program, we'll watch the astronauts prepare for their re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. Shepard, Gizenko and Krikalov especially are excited about the prospect of setting foot on Earth after four and a half months in space. Those preparations come to a sudden halt when Houston Control advises there's been a dramatic change of plan. Discovery is ordered to delay her return by at least a day. Join us next time when we return to the International Space Station for the conclusion of Mission STS-102.